Obviously, President Obama winning a second term. We have heard a concession speech, a short, to the point, and gracious concession speech tonight from Mitt Romney. Uh, we've also heard a, a long and expansive victory speech from President Obama, but there are still races that are being decided right now. I want to take you right now to the Senate in terms of what's going on in the Senate. We've got three races in the Senate that are still too close to call. The first one in Nevada, the Democrat Shelley Berkeley, uh, the Republican Dean Heller there, the Nevada race is too close to call. Um, also in Montana, the race is too close to call between incumbent Democrat John Tester and Republican Congressman Denny Reber. The third Senate race that is too close to call is in North Dakota with 91% of the vote in. Look at the difference in the vote total there. Heidi Heitkamp, the Democrat there. Rick Berg, the Republican. So Nevada, Montana, and North Dakota, too close to call. In terms of the Senate, Democratic pickups. In Connecticut, in Indiana, and in Massachusetts, we've got pickups. Connecticut, it is Chris Murphy. In Indiana, it's Joe Donnelly. In Massachusetts, it's Elizabeth Warren. There is a pickup in the Senate for independence. In Maine, that had been a Republican seat, uh, but when independent and into the independent Angus King is going to be picking up that seat in Maine that had previously been held by Olympia Snow. Uh, in terms of the Republican pickups, uh, there was one Republican Senate pickup tonight. The Nebraska seat that previously had been held by Ben Nelson uh, will now go to Deb Fisher, who is the Republican candidate in that Nebraska Senate seat, defeating Democrat uh, Bob Kerry. Uh, just in terms of some of these notable races, um, the, a lot of the Senate races were very close and very interesting tonight. Obviously, the Republicans got that one pickup. Democrats got three pickups. We've still got three too close to call. But when you look at the races that have been decided, these are just some big headline results. Uh, in Wisconsin, we've got Tommy Thompson, four-term governor of Wisconsin, being defeated by Tammy Baldwin. This is the first time an openly gay woman has been elected uh, to the United States Senate. It's the first time that any incumbent, non-incumbent openly gay person has been elected to the U.S. Senate. Um, in New Mexico, Martin Heinrich, the Democrat, uh, has won that seat there. Uh, that was a very hard-fought seat there in New Mexico. In Virginia, the projected winner is the Democratic former governor of Virginia, Tim Kaine. In Missouri, it would have been difficult for Claire McCaskill to hold on to the seat in any circumstances other than these ones that she won in tonight, beating Todd Aiken tonight to hold on to her seat in Missouri. In Ohio, Sherrod Brown, facing a tide of outside money, defeats Josh Mandel and holds on to his Senate seat in Ohio. In Pennsylvania, Bob Casey also defeating a self-funded, very well-off challenger who fought him very hard, Tom Smith, in Pennsylvania. In Florida, Democratic incumbent Senator Bill Nelson holds on to his seat, a harsh challenge against from Connie Mack. And in Hawaii, the first time we have discussed this race tonight, the Senate seat. This was an honest, sort of an unexpectedly tough race for a very blue state. Maisie Hirono, the Democrat, facing off against Linda Lingle, uh, the Republican there. Uh, the Senate at this hour, the overall Dem pickup is two. Uh, Dem Democrats with 51 seats, the Republicans with 44 seats. A lot of people were projecting that the Democrats would be able to hold on to the Senate. Not very many people were projecting that they would be increasing their margin. Here's some interesting facts about New Hampshire. Something very interesting has happened in the state of New Hampshire tonight. This is the governor's race. Maggie Hassan, the Democrat, defeating, defeating Ovid LaMontagne. But also in New Hampshire, in terms of the other races in that state, in District 1, there's two congressional districts in New Hampshire. Carol Shea Porter defeats Frank Ginta in 1st Congressional District. So that means we've got Maggie Hassan, the Democrat. We've also got Carol Shea Porter, the Democrat. In the other congressional district in New Hampshire, District 2, look at this. We've got Ann Custer, the Democrat, defeating Charlie Bass, the Republican. Are you noticing a pattern here that is more than just partisan? In terms of the U.S. Senators from New Hampshire, neither of these two serving U.S. Senators from New Hampshire was up for re-election tonight, so they both continue to serve. Gene Shaheen, the Democrat, and Kelly Ayotte, the Republican. What that means is that New Hampshire, in terms of its federal office holders and its statewide office holders, we've got a Democratic governor, Maggie Hassan. We've got two Democratic members of Congress, Annie Custer and Carol Shea Porter. And we've got two U.S. Senators, Gene Shaheen and Kelly Ayotte. It is a 100% female leadership corps in the great state of New Hampshire. Live free or die indeed. The um, only no. Democratic woman governor in the, in the country. Oh, God, that's right, isn't it? 
It's the Senate races tonight, uh, right now, I think, I may have the numbers wrong, but I think we've got, even before we get the Heidi Heitkamp race settled and the Shelley Berkeley race settled in North Dakota and Nevada, we've got 19 women in the U.S. Senate after tonight. It's the highest number there's ever been. It used to be always, in the, all the novels, it was always like two women. Yeah. And it always said, by the consent, there was always like two women. You know. 19, Margaret it Chase might Smith be 21. Those, Maureen Newberger. Yeah. There's always about two of them now. Obviously... We're getting very close to uh, uh, elimination of the glass ceiling. I want to bring Crystal Ball into this discussion. Crystal, obviously, uh, to have a record high number of women serving in the Senate uh, is an exciting thing in terms of that. In terms of that glass ceiling. That said, if we do get, we've got 19, we might get up to 21. Uh, we're still not anywhere near gender parity there. So right. it's, a, it, it's a big night, uh, big night for women tonight. Well, it's it's actually an amazing jump from 17 was the previous high up to, as you said, as as high as 21. What's amazing though is that that number seems so high. As you mentioned, yeah. we're obviously nowhere near gender parity. But what we find is when Democrats tend to do well across the country, the numbers of women in office tend to increase. And that's not a partisan statement. That's a factual statement. Back in 2010, when Republicans swept the country and really had strong shows in state legislatures, in Senate races, in gubernatorial races across the country, it was the first time in history that women had actually decreased in the number of seats that they held in the House of Representatives. So what we find is in general, when Democrats do well, women do well. We've also had a remarkable situation, as you know, and as you've been covering, with the focus on women's health issues in this election. That also sort of set up in 2010 when Republicans took control of state legislatures, pushed very extreme anti-choice, anti-abortion measures, record numbers, 1,100 provisions introduced in 2011, historic proportions, and it really prompted a backlash across the country. So even in states like Virginia, where you didn't have a woman on the ballot, you had women's issues playing a very central role there. Tim Kaine, who ran, obviously, successfully tonight for the Senate, also ran for governor successfully in 2005. And I took a look at his platform then versus now on the issue of abortion just to see how much the framing of that issue has changed, the landscape of it has changed. In 2005, he led by saying, I have a faith-based opposition to abortion. Now he comes right on in his platform and affirms his commitment to upholding Roe v. Wade. Mm. So that just tells you how much that issue has shifted across the country. You, you know, Crystal, it'll be really interesting, I think, to watch um, the, uh, the, the final data come out of Virginia. I think one of the things that's been underappreciated in this national race is how much the governing experience of the last couple of years in these states may have affected the way people were thinking about the presidential race. And people will be thinking about it differently in Ohio and Virginia based on what has been happening with state government there. Um, we did see a strong gender gap heading into this race in Virginia. Uh, ultimately, Virginia did go to the president tonight, and we've had really sort of off-the-hook women's rights fights in Virginia right. uh, with Governor Bob McDonald. It'd be interesting to see if that ended up affecting both that Senate race and that presidential race, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, Virginia is my home state, so I watched it pretty closely. And Virginia was the place where they tried to pass legislation that would require women seeking an abortion to undergo a transvaginal probe, something that even for a state that is still a pretty conservative state in Virginia, even though it looks quite blue tonight, uh, was just totally over the line. They also tried to pass a bill, personhood legislation, which 12 states, uh, in addition to Virginia, across the country, they're tried mm -hmm. to pass at the ballot box or through the legislatures. <coughs> Such an extreme measure that even voters in Mississippi, arguably the most pro-life state in the country, rejected <laughs> out of hand. It was a big to-do in Virginia. People were really aware of it, really upset by it. And it did play quite a, an important role in the Kane allen race. It was a topic of <coughs> conversation and debates, particularly actually the personhood initiative came up in several of their debates. Tim Kaine was really on the offensive on the issue, and again, as a native Virginian, someone who ran for office in that state, it was remarkable to me that a pro-choice, pro-women's health uh, message could really be a winning message in Virginia this year. Sure. And of course, uh, on, the, on the other side of that, seeing Todd Akin and Richard Murdoch lose um, after, in states where they might otherwise have been expected to win after those comments that they made uh, that were so outre on that issue. Crystal Absolutely. Ball, thank you very much. It's a late, late night. Thanks for being with us. I really <laughs> appreciate pleasure. it. My pleasure. Thanks, Rachel. All right, we've been doing a lot of speculating in terms of how this second term for President Obama might change the governing environment in Washington. Well, we have to speculate no longer on part of that. We've got a reaction and overt and 
I think, very surprising reaction um, from Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. That's next. We'll be right back.